Well, we finally made it. We've come to our final study here in the book of Acts. We started 10 months ago. Hardly seems like it's been that long, but last September began our journey, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And it begins tonight with this final leg of the journey, the Apostle Paul going to the very place that Jesus himself, back in chapter 23, had told the Apostle Paul definitively, Paul, you will go to, Jerusalem, or you will go to Rome and you will preach of me. And so we now come to that time. Most prominent city in the world, the capital of the Roman Empire, that place where the Apostle will be imprisoned now under house arrest for an additional two years and the whole time uh, take the opportunity to preach the gospel as well as write what we call the prison epistles. So Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and the short letter to Philemon. And so it's going to be a fruitful couple of years, much like his time spent in Caesarea Maritima, uh, where he was in prison there, and he meets with Felix and Festus, Ultimately, he's sent on his journey, he's chased out of Jerusalem, and all the while, the same message is going forth, the message of the good news of the gospel. He couldn't be deterred. And so, after the shipwreck, after the storm, after the perilous journey, after this time that most of us would have cashed in and given up, we find the Apostle Paul doing what he did to the end of his life, and that's he ran the race well. So would you pray with me? And let's pick up tonight in verse 11 as we finish here. Acts chapter 28, the final chapter in this amazing book. Father, again, we are the continuing saga. Lord, we are the other end of this story. Lord, some 2,000 years later, as we pick up where the Apostle Paul left off, taking the good news of the gospel, to the uttermost parts of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Lord, just as Acts 1-8 began, so it still continues. The good news going around the world. And Lord, we are so blessed. As this week, as we have so many of our friends from all over the world gathered with us as we meet at the pastor's conference, Lord, uh, would there be a time of encouragement much like the Apostle Paul receives when he gets to Rome, a foreign land, where he's taken his prisoner, uh, but you have gone before him, and he receives a greeting. Lord, we greet those who've gone before us, and we pray, God, that you would bless us tonight with your Spirit's presence again, afresh and new. Oh, how we need you, Holy Spirit. Put power into our lives so that we might carry on. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 11, Acts 28. And then after three months... Uh, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers. Uh, and so we pick up the story of the apostle. He's now going to get on another Egyptian ship from Alexandria, the other side of the Mediterranean. Uh, as we previously discussed and discovered, these are rather large vessels for the time, uh, many of them several hundred feet long, two to three hundred feet long, could carry upwards of a hundred tons of raw grain. So fairly large ships, but they were designed not for comfort, uh, but to haul a lot of cargo. And so the Apostle Paul, along with the remaining uh, portion of his team, certainly Dr. Luke, uh, and those who travel, were traveling with him, uh, Publius, the centurion, a few Roman guards, and they're going to make the remainder of the journey uh, to modern-day Italy. And their ship that they joined on to had wintered at the island and landing at Syrac Syracuse uh, we stayed for three days and from there we circled around and reached Regium and after one day the south wind began to blow and the next day next day we came to Putoli where we found the brethren and so all along the way and this is one of the important parts of this final little journey here in the book of Acts God strategically places his people 
And maybe you don't feel as though you're one of those strategic placements. From God's perspective, that is exactly who each of you are. You've been strategically placed in the body of Christ so as to be there when the Lord needs you. And here we find in the most strange places people that you would not think would be there, and yet God, knowing the need, uh, sends these people ahead much like he did as we saw last time in the life of Joseph. Joseph ends up in Egypt during a famine, but he didn't get there by just any means, and it wasn't a means that any of us would have picked. But nonetheless, here are the brethren meeting the Apostle Paul uh, as he continues on his journey, and we were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we went towards Rome, Paul making that final a step of his journey. And the thing that's interesting and has always been interesting to me about this conclusion to the book of Acts is it almost seems anticlimactic. When you look at it, he's just gone through this perilous journey and it's kind of like you almost want it to end there with the snake bite on the island of Malta and somehow something amazing happens. But there's really a picture here of our lives because our lives are much like the Apostle Paul's. We go through storms, we go through shipwrecks, we go through perilous journeys, but most of the time it's just doing life. It's living, it's continuing onward, it's pressing on in the day to day. It is the mundane things that we might otherwise miss that end up often being the most glorious things that are used in our lives. It's those day-to-day -day contacts, it's those people that you bump into seemingly uh, of no consequence. They're the people along the way. They're the people in the grocery store. They're the people at the gas station. They're your friends, they're your family. There's that guy on the corner, the strange person that you walk past when you walk your dog and you get an opportunity to just speak to him about Jesus. And that is really the picture here with the Apostle Paul as he heads this, on this final leg towards Rome. Yes, he's been through a shipwreck. Yes, he's nearly been tossed overboard. Yes, there's been this in, incredible thing that happens to him as he throws a pile of sticks on a fire on Malta and he's bitten by a snake and he lives and everybody thinks that, you know, finally Nemesis has run him down. But most of our lives are just the simple things. Family of God, sometimes it's just the way you raise your kids. Sometimes it's just being a great parent. Sometimes it's being a, an amazing husband or a wife. Sometimes the, the, the most wonderful things that God accomplishes in us are, are that place that you went to that we call a job, but from God's perspective, he had strategically placed hundreds if not thousands of people in your way and you got a chance to touch each one of those lives as you journeyed towards the end of your time here on this earth. Don't miss that. We, we love to hear the stories that come from the mission field. We love to be a part of those stories if we possibly can. But there's an awful lot of amazing things that happen right at the dinner table. Don't miss those things. Finally, they drop anchor. They're, they've made it to, to what we call Italy. The headquarters of the Roman Empire is just 230 miles away now. We're going to head up the Appian Way, which is the main north-south route uh, that would take you eventually, if you traveled on it to its furthest extent, would take you all the way up into what we would call Europe. And so now they've made that journey. It's interesting, this figurehead, uh, if you've ever watched any movie that seems to have a, a tremendous amount of sailing ships in it, especially during the 1800s, 1700s, you almost always have a figurehead on the bow, on the prow of the ship, that pointy object that jutted out on the bow of the ship. Uh, the figurehead would be out there, and normally it represented something that was important to that particular ship, maybe its captain, perhaps the crew or someone who owned it. In this case, it was the twin brothers. The twin brothers uh, from Greek mythology were the twin sons, Castor and Pollux, of Zeus. And so they were known as kind of the, the guardians of all things maritime. 
And so here this ship is, is traveling, and it kind of gives the, the Grecian people and the Romans who are with them, it's like, wow, you know, Paul's being carried to the shore by the, the twin suns, the, their constellation, and from, from a, a, a perspective of the mentality of someone who was Greek, would have been Gemini, so these twins that travel together. And really it kind of gives us the picture of the Apostle Paul's life. It seemed like he was always being associated with things other than the actual message that he was going to bring. And I think God protected him very often by immersing him in the culture. Every place he went, he, and, and that's why I believe he could say with utter confidence, to the Greeks, I became Greek. And to the Jews, I became a Jew. And his whole purpose was that he might win some. And so wherever he went, he wasn't offended because he was on a ship that had a masthead with the twin sons of Zeus. You see, here's what happens. The legalist goes, man, I can't believe Paul didn't take out a chainsaw and cut that sucker off. You know, it's like, how could he get on a ship with a, with a Greek masthead on it? Paul didn't get caught up in that kind of stuff. He was not busy picketing Walmart. He, he wasn't out going, man, I can't believe I'm over here with the Greek gods. Just wherever he went, he took Jesus with him. He wasn't concerned about all that stuff. And too many of us, I think, get sidetracked in things that ultimately don't matter, and we turn into legalists, and we miss the opportunity to actually share the gospel with somebody who's standing right in front of us because they are the person that actually previously was worshiping Castor and Pollux. Instead, we're worried about the fact that they're worshiping Castor and Pollux instead of sharing the gospel with them. Can't believe they do that. Please don't let that be you. Seize every opportunity you have to preach the gospel. It may not look like everyone else is preaching of the gospel. It doesn't have to. Keep the message the message. There's one Savior. His name is Jesus. He died on Calvary's cross. Keep that part of the message. And the rest of it, to the Greeks be Greeks. Hang out with people. You got somebody in your neighborhood and they're a baseball fan, talk to them about baseball and tell them about Jesus. They're a football fan, talk to them about football and tell them about Jesus. If they like to go fishing, talk to them about fishing, tell them about Jesus. You get the picture? Oh, well, you know, fishing's not spiritual. Sure it is. All the disciples were fishermen. The point is we need to take those opportunities. Don't let them pass you by. It gives you a missionary heart. God can use you anywhere if you'll, if you'll think this way. I'll be next week, uh, we leave this, this week, we have a pastor's conference here. Next week we have a pastor's conference down in Cartagena, Colombia. You know, uh, there's going to be all kinds of things. We land in Panama and we fly over to Cartagena. When I get there, it's not going to look like here. But if I'm worried about what it looks like, I won't take the message. You need to be worried about the message. And so they head towards Rome, circle around, they reach Regium, and they're on their journey now. Modern day Reggio, by the way, they're on the very bottom of Italy. They'll transfer up to Puzzoli in, in modern day terms. They're on the Bay of Naples, and so they're finally on the Italian mainland. And what we see here is, is Paul begins to make friends, he begins to open himself up to be used. And he, he's not looking at ministry from a specific perspective, he's just letting ministry come to him. Please let ministry come to you. It's going to be crazy at times. You're going to find ministry virtually everywhere that you go if you're willing to have a ministry heart. You see, because ultimately, whether you know it or not, 
If you're in here tonight and you know the Lord Jesus, you've actually been called to be a missionary. It's part of the Great Commission. You, you can't, you're supposed to go therefore into all the world and make disciples. And that's not confined to a certain group of people called missionaries or pastors or teachers or elders. It's just what the body of Christ is supposed to do. So really we kind of see Paul setting the standard for all of us here. Verse 15, he goes on to say, and from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came and met us as far as from uh, the Appian Forum or the Appian Way. And so they're now making this final leg of the journey. And if you can see it, they're going to round the coast of Sicily. They're going to head up the, the coast of the western side of Italy. And they went to three inns, and there Paul saw them, and he thanked God and took courage. How often do you meet with people that maybe have come back from the mission field and you just remind them that you've been praying for them, that you love them, that you're in it with them, and, and that little bit of being the contact place for the Holy Spirit in that person's life is an encouragement that keeps them moving forward in ministry. Far too many people in the body of Christ have the gift of discouragement. They seem to know exactly what to say to basically suck the spiritual life out of most everyone. Exercise the gift of encouragement frequently and often. People need it. They need to be lifted up. Life is tough enough. They, they don't need a beat down and, and to be told exactly what's wrong with how they're doing whatever it is they're doing. They need to know that God still has a plan for their life. Paul hears these words and, and he thanks God and he takes, he takes courage from them. He's now about 35 miles south of Rome, so he's getting close. Now bear in mind, God has not told the Apostle Paul how long he's going to preach the gospel in Rome. He didn't say when you get there, you're gonna be under house arrest and you're gonna get your own place, and people are gonna be able to freely come and go. The Apostle Paul does not know that part of what we now know because we have the finished work that, that is accomplished by the Apostle Paul. So we get the privilege of on the backside understanding that Paul is gonna be there for quite a while. He's not gonna die instantaneously, but the Apostle Paul does not know that. And it's an important part of the story because the Apostle Paul is not going, oh, woe is me, I'm going to Rome to die. He's not sitting there going, oh, I can't believe I'm on this arduous journey. You know, I'm just not going to talk to anybody because I'm only going to be alive for a couple of days anyway. Paul actually thinks he may not be around, so he's taking exactly the opposite position and using every second as if it's his last. Are you using every second of your life as if it's your last? As we were talking this morning, if you were with us, are you ready to see the Lord? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for the rapture of the church? Have you made the very best of every moment of every day? Now, not to condemn anyone, but if you haven't, change the way you see life. Say, God, I want to use every second for your glory. Give me a divine appointment, and I promise you I will take advantage of it. Whether the journey's hard or whether it's easy, whether it's short or whether it's long, whether you're on the Appian Way on your way to prison or whether you're on your way to vacation, use that time for the Lord. He's got a plan for it. So they check in at three taverns, and the tavern during that time was really uh, like we would call a B&B &B today. They were normally people's homes that had been maybe slightly expanded to handle a few extra guests. An extra long, uh, normally a triclinium or a three-sided table would be set up in a main room, and uh, you would get a place to lay your head and a meal. And so they're, they're in this place called three taverns. Perhaps there were three of them. Maybe there used to be three. We don't know. But we do know that 
Paul was getting courage from being encouraged by people who met him. It's an important function of the body of Christ. One of the joys, I, I, one of the great joys for me when I travel around and, and tomorrow when we head to the pastor's conference is to meet friends and, and to greet them and to see what God's doing in their life and to join together in, in that sense that we have a common purpose. And Connie and I were talking yesterday morning, and uh, we, we kind of carried on the conversation today. Look, you, you can look at life from really two basic perspectives. One is it's just going to go on and on and on. And, you know, you can kind of feel like whatever you're going through today is going to go on forever. Or you can say, no, life is actually short. And you can take some joy from that. Life is short. It is a vapor. And you don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. So make today count. For every possible good for the glory of God that you can get out of it. Enjoy it. Encourage people. Verse 16, And now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, and Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier who guarded him. He's now arrived just as Jesus had promised back in verse 11 of chapter 23. And he's got private lodging. Now, bear in mind, this was not government-sponsored housing. The apostle Paul was responsible for his own home. He would have had to have rented it, and no doubt some of the support that came to him came from the churches that he had helped plant. Could have been any, any number of them. Uh, but he is going to have his own place, and uh, he's now going to be guarded around the clock, four-hour shifts by a soldier. He's going to be chained, in essence, but free to receive guests. The very best of both worlds, really, if you're going to be in prison, because he has a measure of freedom, and at the same time, he, he also can receive people pretty much at will. And that's going to be the case, and letters are going to go from him to other places. And he'll write those, things, those books that we call the prison epistles from there. Paul's first act is now going to be to call together his Jewish uh, leaders that are in that region. And you, you remember back in the very beginning of the book of Acts, we found that the church began to spread rather quickly from Jerusalem. And if you were in Jerusalem and you traveled up to the port city, Herod City there of Caesarea Maritima, uh, and you would have boarded the ship, chances are that at least a portion of the people that were on that ship would have eventually made it to Rome. And so you can see God's incredible wisdom to get the gospel out by putting Paul in prison in a port city and keep him there for a couple of years. Because what has happened from Paul's time in Caesarea Maritima is now there are people who have heard the good news of the gospel. There are people who heard of his plight with the Jewish people, how he was persecuted by the Sanhedrin and driven literally uh, out of Jerusalem, chased up to Caesarea, and so that now has kind of paved the way for where the Apostle Paul now is. Sometimes we don't see our lives that way. We, we see everything kind of in the moment, and yet God is doing that Romans 8, 28 thing with us. He's working all things together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, but we can't see the purpose yet. But God does. And I believe that's the case here. Three days, it says there in verse 17, after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders and said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem, handed over to the Roman government. And even though I had done nothing against our people or our customs or even our ancestors, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation to kind of give you a sense of how the apostle would have, would have spoken that linguistically. He's saying, look, I haven't done anything. Not against our ancestors, not against the law. And while he was there in Caesarea Maritima, he had a couple of years there defending himself. And you remember the case, he, he's, he's there in the theater. And he comes in, and here comes, here comes every person who mattered in that region of the world. It's like, hey, let's go watch Paul's trial. And because of that, there were literally thousands of people who had a very keen understanding. There was this crazy guy from Jerusalem who kept preaching about this Jesus guy who had been killed and was raised from the dead. And he refused to stop saying that no matter what happened. 
God does that in your life. Sends people ahead for you as well. And it says there at the end of verse 17, and yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem to the hands of the Romans. And, and so he, he's now moving his way uh, kind of loosely through society there in Rome. And he begins where he always begins. Now, if you remember the whole time that we've been here in this book, the Apostle Paul, being a Jew, being a rabbi, being of the Pharisees, being a member of the Sanhedrin, he always seeks out uh, those in the region with whom he could communicate most clearly because remember, again, they were not carrying around King James Bibles. They weren't able to pull those out. They didn't, none of those things were in circulation. But what they did know was the Old Testament. And one of the ways that the Apostle Paul frequently and often, and actually most often, got the gospel out was reminding them that the prophets, that the Old Testament itself, spoke of the coming Messiah. And so he says, I haven't said anything against him. Verse 18, he goes on, who when they had, had examined me wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not because I'd done anything of which they could accuse my nation. But he says, look, I, I did everything I possibly could to win them without appealing to Caesar. But in the end, take all means necessary to be able to keep preaching the gospel. I've been in a number of situations in foreign countries. I remember one very specifically. We were in, down in Brazil. We're working on the facility, the conference center down there. And we had about a dozen kids that had come from all over the place to, to serve down there. And every last one of them had let their visa run out. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, what are you doing? So we got this wild idea that we would take all of them into Argentina, go across the border, and then come back into Brazil. We figured, oh, they'll get new visas that way. Well, that works really, really well unless you have a Russian with you. And they're like, why do you Americans have Russians with you? So they immediately thought something was horrifically wrong. And, and they started to ask questions. And they were asking, you know, the typical things. Who's winning the baseball race right now? Because they wanted to figure out if we were really Americans or whether we were Russians with fake passports. And finally, we had to appeal to the, the U.S. consulate. And the consulate actually sent somebody to go to the border to check these people out and to check to make sure that the passports were actually legit. Now, we tried to do it the way that we saw best, but eventually you just have to say, look, we're American citizens. Get the consulate here. It all worked out. Nobody had to stay in Argentina. Paul appeals to Caesar. It was his last recourse. It was the last thing he could do. And as he's on this journey, he, he begins to speak to him. He says, for this reason I've called you together to see you, to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I'm bound in these chains. If you're with us on, with us on Thursday night, we're in, we're in Romans chapter 9. We're about to transition into chapter 10. And chapters 9, 10, and 11 are this incredible picture uh, of God's plan for the nation Israel. Paul was very well aware that he had been called to preach to the Gentiles, but he absolutely still had a love for his own people, so much so that in chapter 9, he said, I wish that I myself would be cut off, in essence, that they might be saved. He said, I, I would gladly give my life for my countrymen so that they could come to know Messiah. It's that same person that's speaking here in Rome now. He's saying, look, I'm bound with this chain because I have the only hope that Israel has. There is no other hope outside of Messiah. And I've met him. Verse 21, he goes on, he said, Then he said to, to him, We neither receive letters from Judea concerning you, nor have spoken to any brethren who came or reported or spoke any evil of you. He says, there's, there's no charges against you here. 
Your record is clear. But we desire to hear from you what you think. We're concerning this sect. And so they go back to the people of the way. This group of kind of rebel Jews that in essence had come to, to believe that Jesus Christ was in fact Messiah. And so the Jewish people were still looking at it as, as an aberration of the Jewish faith. So they call him, he's a sect leader, he's a cult leader. And we know that it is spoken against everywhere. And says, so we want to hear what you have to say about that. We haven't heard anything about you specifically, but oh yeah, this whole Jesus thing, this whole you know the Messiah thing, oh yeah, we've heard about that. So people were talking against Christianity. They were talking about the, the relationship that the Apostle Paul claimed to have with Jesus himself. But the Apostle Paul and those Christians that had gone before were committed to a higher authority than Caesar. They were committed to Christ. And that story wasn't going to change no matter who questioned him. And it's interesting that in, in their thinking, you know, all of these, these various people that the Apostle Paul speaks to, they're all here in the gospel. You know the Apostle Paul was not letting any opportunity go to preach Christ. But they missed it by that much. We need to make sure that we keep preaching, even if people miss it. Whether they're complete, they don't want to hear it, or whether they well, I just don't know. Your responsibility it is not to see to it that anyone gets saved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Your responsibility is to preach the gospel faithfully. Christ alone saves by grace alone, through faith alone. All you do is present the gospel. And if you do that, the results are in his hands. You just keep preaching it. Keep teaching it. Keep speaking it. Keep living it. Let people see that you're not going to change your story, no matter who asks you. One of the things that's problematic, and, and I've shared, with, shared this with you before, one of the chief reasons that I get as a pastor for people not wanting to become a, a believer in Christ, two things, one is church and the other is Christians. And what usually follows that line of thinking is they're hypocrites because they say one thing and do another. Leave the gospel the gospel. You know, it's going to offend some people. They're going to get really upset. If you tell somebody who's overtly religious and in, and, and in maybe some other religion, if you want to call it that, as opposed to a re relationship with Jesus Christ, when you talk to somebody who's engaged in religion, and you tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, they're going to be offended. You kind of need to get over that. But don't change the message, because I've heard believers do this. Well, you know, you have your way to God. There isn't another way to God. There's one way. His name is Jesus. Amen. So you need to stick with that way. Otherwise, you do a disservice to the body of Christ, to the Lord himself. Because he's the one that said that. That's not Pastor Jeff's take on it. Those are the words of Jesus. You don't want people to miss heaven by inches because you missed the gospel by a mile. Preach the gospel. Verse 23 goes on. And when they had appointed him a day... And many came to him, they were at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God. Now I want you to see this very clearly because it illustrates what I just said. He explained very solemnly and testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the, get this, wasn't the New Testament, didn't pull out a four spiritual laws tract. He didn't, didn't reach back there into the recesses of the good news of the gospel. 
from both the law of Moses and the prophets. You see, they, they didn't know the Gospels yet. There was no New Testament floating around. From morning till evening, and some were pers persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. Now, what would Paul have been telling them? And this is a beautiful picture. Sometimes I actually had a conversation in the foyer today. And, and the question basically was this. Well, you know, there was an angry God in the Old Testament. And I said, really? How angry was he? Well, you know, he had the Jewish people kill women and children. Yep, he did. But I said, what was his point in that? Was it to kill women and children? Or, or was it that they had been continually evil and he was preserving the righteous remnant for a later day? Which, which do you think that was? Was it just God being mean? And we kind of went back and forth for a little bit. And I said, do you realize that the gospel was preached in the Old Testament? He says, no, there's no way. I said, yes, way. And he said, no, that's not true. I said, yes, he did. I said, matter of fact, there are 418 very specific prophetic windows contained in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. And he said, what? And I said, yeah, have you ever read the book of Isaiah? He said, well, you know, I kind of glanced at it, but it's kind of boring. And I said, really? I said, well, let's just condense it down for him. Let me give you some chapters. I want you to go read them. Read chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 52, and chapter 53. And then you come back and tell me if it's boring. And I said, oh, by the way, you answer the question before you come back to me. Answer the question, who do you think that is? that's being spoken about. The chastisement of our peace, my peace, was put upon him. The seed of the woman of Genesis revealed Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, father of eternity, he says, well, what else? I said, well, read, you know, why don't you read Psalm 22 while you're at it? Uh, read Psalm 16 while you're at it. And I said, no, by the way, do you like Proverbs? He said, yeah, I like Proverbs. I said, read Proverbs 30. And he said, Proverbs? I said, yeah, Proverbs. And I said, specifically verse 4. Who has ascended unto heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? You know, a Jewish person would know how to answer that. There'd be exactly one answer to that particular question. That would be Jehovah. That would be Yahweh would be the person that would do that. Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? This is all one verse, by the way. In the book of Proverbs, by the way. Who's established all the ends of the earth? And then it says something that freaks people out. What is his name? What is his son's name? Oi, they, you mean Yahweh's got a son? Yeah, he's got a son. It's in the book of Proverbs. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul sitting there talking to a bunch of Jewish people in their synagogue? Yeah. You know, Agur, when he wrote that, asked a pretty crazy question. Can you tell me his name? Who hold, Well, you know who, that's, that's Yahweh. Yeah, he's got a son. Really? God has a son? Uh-huh. His name is Jesus. Yahushua? God is salvation? You see how the Apostle Paul would have handled that? He would have preached the gospel to him from the Old Testament. Some believed, some were persuaded, some disbelieved. Verse 25, And so when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. 
And guess what he does? He quotes from the prophet Isaiah. I love this. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through the prophet Isaiah and to our fathers saying, go to this people and say, and he's quoting now from Isaiah 6, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. God has a son. Seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. He's saying, look, the very word of God has always said these things. It's not a different message. It's the message. It's now complete in Messiah. But the message is still the message. Verse 28, And therefore let it be known to all all of you that salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. He's saying, look, our Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has been telling us about Messiah for a very, very, very long time. And no doubt, he's just running down a long list of messianic passages from the law and from the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah. He could have just gone on and on and on. And so he's making the best of another bad situation. It's not looking good. It looks like they're not listening. But here's the crazy thing about people that you think are not listening. They may simply not be deciding but I can almost guarantee you that they did not not hear. They heard you, but for whatever reason, they're unwilling to say that they're going to make a decision, but you have planted the seed in their heart so they have the opportunity. Maybe those words that you spoke will be the words that will actually turn them in a time of need. Maybe that last moment of life, they don't know what to do or who to cry out to, but you faithfully told them the good news that Jesus died on Calvary's cross for them. And so they have the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity to change someone's eternal destination by sharing the gospel with them. You see, it's very true. Matter of fact, by the time uh, Constantine would come around, eventually Christianity would become the official religion of Rome. And as aberrant as that religion was, it was still nonetheless very different than worshiping Zeus. And so they they had an opportunity to hear the truth. And while they didn't have their theologies correct, they definitely knew that Jesus Christ was God's son. And so the word did go out Verse 29, and when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. And so Paul is calling these Jewish brothers together. He speaks to them, and, and they begin to dispute. And I think the dispute is over the fact that some of them kind of got it, and some of them did not believe. And so they're going back and forth. You know, a little healthy interchange of ideas and discourse is a good thing. You know, sometimes you you hear people and they get a little bit tweaked at what you said, but that doesn't mean that they're not actually mulling it over and thinking and pondering. So just tell them the truth. Paul continued to do that. And as they're disputing, they're going on their way. And then Paul dwelt a whole two years in his own rented house. And I love the way this this draws to a close. It is is so anticlimactic. You know, there's not a gigantic revival. You you don't find Augustus coming to faith in Christ. You you don't find, you know, an entire Roman cohort coming to his house and all of a sudden, you know, a flash of lightning from heaven. There's none of that. Paul dwelt a whole two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and forbidding no one to come to him. In other words, he just opened up his home. 
He didn't start a church. He was in prison. But he was loosely in prison. He probably could have done pretty much anything he wanted to do as long as he stayed chained to the guard. But Paul spoke to, no doubt, ultimately, thousands which have turned into, over time, millions of people. We still read those words tonight. Timothy visited him, visited him. We find that out in the book of Philippians and Colossians, Philemon. Tychicus visits him. Epaphroditus visits him. Mark visits him. I mean, Paul gets all these people coming through his, through his house, and he just speaks the message of the cross to them. And during that time of freedom, uh, he, he may actually have been able to travel somewhat. Some believe that he actually traveled to Spain during that time. As long as he stayed with his Roman guard, he got to do whatever he wants. The books of Timothy and Titus were written during this time. The prison epistles written during this time. And the Greek word that's used here, without hindrance, are, 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 they're the last words in the book of Acts. That's pretty triumphal considering he's in prison. He's in prison and yet he's able to preach the gospel without hindrance. Most, most of us in here would not say, well, I'm going to go to prison so I can preach the gospel without hindrance. And yet that's exactly what happened with the Apostle Paul. And here's the beauty. And this is where we'll, we'll leave the story because we don't actually leave it. We're the continuing saga, the unending story of the book of Acts. It's us. You see, the, the, the book of Acts was not about the Apostle Paul. It, it, yes, it contains an awful lot about him. Much of it is written about his story. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit in the world bringing people to faith in Christ. And that work still continues. It continues tonight. Yes, we saw mighty miracles. Yes, we saw God do incredible things. Yes, we see the first martyrs in the church. We see James and Stephen and all these guys. We see the Holy Spirit working in very ordinary people in extremely extraordinary circumstances. We saw merchants. We saw travelers. We saw slaves. We saw jailers. We saw church leaders. We saw men. We saw women. We saw Gentiles. We saw Jews. We saw rich people. We saw poor people. You get the picture? We saw the work of the Holy Spirit in anyone who wanted to be used. Anyone who said yes to the Spirit using them. And though this book kind of ends abruptly, it's like, boop, over. It's really like dot, 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 dot. There's my brother John from Peru. Pastor Guna was here from India this morning. Chet and I will be in Colombia next week. You get the picture? It's still going on. The book of Acts has, I don't know how many volumes now, but there's a lot of them. This church is currently writing a, a new edition. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ called Calvary Chapel South Bay. And it's got people who were shipwrecked and it's got people who've gone through storms and it's got all kinds of perilous journeys. It's got people coming to faith in Christ. It has mass groups of people coming to know the Lord Jesus all at once. You get the picture? It's the same story to a new generation. And we're blessed to be able to continue it. In essence, it's like all of the great, you know, it, it's, I don't know if you're like me, but there are some times when movies just, they need to stop making sequels and prequels. Star Wars is one of those. It's like they, they just, you know, it's just like that's not any good. But you know what? Every sequel made to this book is a good one. Because it's changing 
the, the destiny of people forever. It's taking them from children of the darkness to children of the light. It's taking them from walking towards a, a, a destination that is eternal separation to, to eternal glory. And so every sequel will have its place in the volumes that are the book of Acts. Charles Spurgeon, when he was writing on this, he said, what was begun with so much heroism ought to be continued with ardent zeal since we're assured that the same Lord is mighty still to carry out his heavenly designs. Amen. He's mighty still. You may not look at yourself as a vehicle through whom the Lord is working, but you are, if you're willing to be. If you're just simply willing to say yes to the journey, and wherever the journey takes you, you stop along the way and just tell people about Jesus, and we get to heaven, have you ever thought what it's going to be like to talk to people in heaven? that casual conversation you had in the line at the grocery store, and there's that person that you didn't think was listening. Those children that you thought went wayward, that you were absolutely sure had walked away from the Lord, but because God is faithful to his word, when they get old, they'll not depart from it. And there they are. Let's continue the saga. Amen.